Fun fact, he recorded that in one take. <laughs> Just saying, apple tree. <laughs> no, but for real, uh, it, t uh, teaching kids and working with students is actually such an incredible opportunity to make a deep impact on the kingdom of God today, tomorrow, and into the future, and we do have a big need for uh, volunteers in our kids' ministry and our youth ministry, um, and so, yeah, definitely reach out to Nancy Cole or Pastor Chad if you want to help out with uh, one of those. We certainly, we could use some more kingdom ministry. So, um, just for fun this week, I went on Amazon to see what kinds of things would be recommended to me if I started to search for really unhealthy food to buy. Did you know you could do that? You could just like tell the internet to absolutely destroy your body with unhealthy food and it will just do it without asking you any questions. Um, anyway, so I, I searched a bunch of unhealthy food. I typed in cheeseburger into the Amazon search bar and it showed me, you know, cheeseburgers in a bag, cheeseburger flavored gummies, even Texas burger space food, which I guess is like a, like a tube of goop that comes out in like, a, like toothpaste almost, but it's used for astronauts. That's how they eat their food, and it's like cheeseburger flavored. Anyways, um, <laughs> yeah, <laughs> the Amazon was going like, what are you doing, dude? I looked up Little Debbie's. I looked up ginormous party-sized snacks, and I just let the recommendations kind of guide me along. I did this for about 20 minutes, and then I closed my browser, and I reopened it because I wanted to see what the Amazon homepage would recommend to me after I had done this. <laughs> this is what it put there for me. You ready? Health supplements, meal replacement, protein drinks, workout equipment, dumbbells, yoga mats, and even books on mental health. <laughs> In other words, Amazon saw what I was looking at and thought, oh, you like Little Debbie's Cheetos and cheeseburgers in a can. Then you should try a healthier life. <laughs> If you're interested in this thing, you should really check out that thing. Uh, if you love this, you could really use that. If this, then that. And, and the, this logical structure is similar to the, what the writer of Hebrews uses to open his letter to a group of nervous Christians um, and who intimidating, intimidated Christians. They were just converted from Judaism to Christianity. They, they, they walked out of Judaism to start following Jesus, the Messiah, and now life for them is getting very hard. They're being persecuted. There's a group of people trying to convince them, stop following Jesus. Just go back to Judaism. Uh, give up on this Jesus nonsense. Rediscover the old, familiar, comfortable ways of living that you grew up with. And so the writer of Hebrews is writing to tell them that nothing that they can go back to, nothing that they can turn to can ever compare to Jesus. And so to start, what he's doing is he's comparing the words of God delivered through angels to the words of God delivered in the flesh through Jesus Christ, the Son of God. And, and if Jesus is greater than the angels, which is what Pastor Jeff preached about last week, if Jesus is greater than the angels, then what comes from Jesus is greater than what comes from the angels. If this, then that. It's an argument from the lesser to the greater. If you, oh, you, you, really, rec you really revere what came out of the angels, well then try Jesus and don't give up. Keep pressing in. Stay faithful. Don't drift away. And so this is kind of how the argument is structured in the opening pages of his letter. So really quick, and we're not going to read this out loud together. We'll get to that in just a moment. But just to review chapter 1 of Hebrews, starting in verse 4, the Son is far greater than the angels, just as the name God gave him is greater than their names. All right, so you got this, you tracking with the logical structure here. That's what he's trying to make, the, the point he's trying to make. For God never said to any angel what he said to Jesus, you are my son, today I've become your father. God also said, I will be his father, that he will be my son. And when he brought his supreme son into the world, God said, let all of God's angels worship him. Regarding the angels, he says, he sends his angels like winds, his servants like flames of fire. But to the son, he says, your throne, O God, endures forever. You rule with the scepter of justice. You, rule, you love justice and hate evil. Therefore, O God, your God has anointed you, pouring out the oil of joy on you more than on anyone else. He also says to the son, 
In the beginning, Lord, you laid the foundation of the earth. You made the heavens with your hands. They will perish, but you will remain forever. They will wear out like old clothing. You will fold them up like a cloak and discard them like old clothing. Because you are always the same. You will live forever. And God never said to any of his angels, sit in the place of honor at my right hand until I humble your enemies, making them a footstool under your feet. Therefore, angels are only servants, spirits sent to care for people who will inherit salvation. That's where we've got to so far in the book of Hebrews. Today, we're going to start off in chapter 2. But before we do that, would you go ahead and pray with me? Jesus, I ask that you would reveal yourself to us today as high and exalted and lifted up and as also someone who wants to enter into our situation and use us to work in our situation and draw us closer to you and then use us to draw other people closer to you. Jesus, I pray that you would speak very powerfully individually to each one of our hearts. That I, I know that there are different scenarios that we are entering this Sunday morning from. There are different angsts, different worries, different fears, different problems, different challenges, different joys, different um, life stories that we're coming from. But we're all coming to you, God. And we need you to speak. So I pray this morning that you would speak through me, that you would anoint my lips, and that the words of God would come out. And that we'd hear you loud and clear, that, our, that, that, that the soil of our heart would be soft and tender for you to plant the seed of your word in, and that we'd be able to receive it today. We pray this in Jesus' name, amen. So just briefly, in the Old Testament, angels are described in three ways, by their nature, by their status, and by their function. In other words, it, the Old Testament explains their nature, what they are, it explains their status, like how they rank, and explains their function, what they do, Okay. So when describing what they are, the Old Testament calls them spirits, heavenly ones, stars, holy ones, even lowercase g, gods. And not like gods like we think of them today, but just a, a way to distinguish them as ones who exist in the spiritual realm, like spirit beings. When referring to how they rank, the Old Testament uses words to describe angels like an assembly or a council or a congregation. So if, for example, if you remember the opening of the book of Job, and Satan is approaching God. He's entering the council, the assembly of all the angels to make an accusation against Job, right? And so um, when referring to what they do, the Old Testament calls them angels, which is simply the word for sent ones, messengers, okay? It calls them ministers, watchers, hosts, mighty ones, mediators, and protectors. Now, that's a lot more than we tend to think about when we're comparing our tiny little chubby baby with a halo and wings um, image of an angel that we have in our mind a lot of times, um, the ancient Jewish mindset about angels was a lot more in-depth than that. And it's the same in the New Testament with even more descriptions. The Apostle Paul talks about these supernatural beings with thrones and dominions and authority. They're seen as spiritual beings who would oversee and administer on God's behalf. And in both the Old and the New Testament... There were also fallen angels, right, demons, uh, that rebelled against God and went to rule and reign for themselves. So, for example, you have in Daniel chapter 10, uh, when Daniel's praying to God, and God sends an angel to go answer his prayer. And then he's encountered by the prince of Persia, who is this apparently, this demonic force, this ruler, this angel, this spirit uh, who is ruling over the territory of Persia. And they are battling it out for three weeks until finally the angel wins the battle and then he's finally able to deliver the prayer or the answer to the prayer that Daniel's been praying for now for 21 days. All right, so there, so there, the angels kind of exist in this like authoritative structure in some realm, as, in some way as well. Um, but here's what's interesting. For many of the writers of the New Testament, the original New Testament word angelos, where we get angel, um, just became this sort of catch-all term for all these supernatural beings, um, especially the ones who serve God. And it's all of these beings that the writer of Hebrews is 
referring to when he's making the point that Jesus is greater than all of these beings, all of these angels. And here's why it matters that he's making this point. There was a very high standard that God had for his people who had received the word of God delivered through angels. Um, In fact, Jewish tradition held that Moses, when he went up on Mount Sinai to receive the commandments from God, it was an angel who delivered those commandments to Moses. That the words of God that they find in their law was from God, they were words of God, but they were delivered by angels. And in fact, the, the New Testament references this assumption three different times. Um, and so the Jewish audience receiving this letter would have been very familiar with this kind of thinking. Um, that's what the writer of Hebrews is relying on to make his point. Why? Because they had an extremely high view of the word of God delivered through his messengers. In fact, their view of God's delivered word was so high that they based their entire uh, civic legal system around it. Not only would they make laws to protect God's words and, and surrounding God's words, they would make laws that protected the laws that protected God's words. And then rabbis would study these and write commentaries on these laws that dictated Jewish customs. And then later rabbis would come along and write commentaries on the commentaries on the laws to protect the laws to protect God's word. <laughs> and this came from an extremely high view, uh, extremely high reverence for the word of God delivered to his people. And so in the opening pages of his letter, the writer of Hebrews is basically setting up this logical formula that sounds like this. If you had such a high view of the word of God delivered by angels, how much more, so it's the argument from the lesser to the greater, How much more should you pay attention to the word of God revealed in the flesh, Jesus Christ the Son? If this, then that. So now that he's made this extremely unbalanced comparison between Jesus and the angels, uh, check out how he drives the point home. And here it is. This is Hebrews chapter 2, and if you're able to, we're going to stand and read this out loud together. Hebrews chapter 2, we're going to read three verses He makes this point. So we must listen very carefully to the truth we have heard, or we may drift away from it. For the message God delivered through angels has always stood firm, and every violation of the law and every act of disobedience was punished. So what makes us think that we can escape if we ignore this great salvation that was first announced by the Lord Jesus himself and then delivered to us by those who heard him speak. Well done. You can have a seat. If you had such a high view of the word of God delivered by angels, how much more should you pay attention to this message of great salvation from Jesus Christ, the word of God revealed in the flesh, the good news of the gospel? What you have heard from angels that they delivered God's messages is important, very important, to the point that you would be punished if you disobeyed it. But even more important is the good news revealed by the Son of God himself. So don't ignore this message of this great salvation. Or you could say it this way, don't hit snooze on the good news. Channel my inner Dr. Seuss today. Don't hit snooze on the good news. Don't ignore this great salvation that has come through Jesus. Wake up and take it seriously. You're taking all these commandments so seriously. Take the gospel of Jesus Christ that liberates you from the bondage of sin and self. Take the gospel seriously. Don't hit snooze on the good news. So, if that's his point, What does that look like in life? When it comes to receiving this warning, the writer of Hebrews makes a significant point. Did you catch it? He says, we have to pay careful attention to the message of Jesus that we have heard so that we don't drift away. Pay careful attention so that we don't drift away. See, the writer's purpose for writing this letter, writing the book of Hebrews, Stick with me, okay? 
is not actually, is not primarily to provide truth theology or proper doctrine, although those are very much included. Stick with me. Don't crucify me yet. The purpose for writing this wasn't just to give us a theology textbook. It was to encourage Jewish Christians not to turn away from faithfully following Jesus. Obviously, sound doctrine and proper theology does exist in the book of Hebrews. Duh. But like the point is, don't drift away from following Jesus. Even when it gets hard, stay faithful, stay committed to following him. If these new believers were not careful, what was going to happen was pressure from unbelieving Jews and these other influences that would, would convince them to give up on following Jesus. It's not worth it. Just go back to what you used to do. See, a boat might drift and be carried downstream past safe harbor if the crew members neglect to watch their position. And just as a boat can drift away, so the Christian can drift away from following Jesus. And maybe you've experienced that in your life, right? Or maybe someone close to you. You heard the message of Jesus, you were very interested in being around him, and you started to make changes in your life to follow him. But over time, you kind of settled into a routine that instead of drawing you closer to Jesus, draws you closer to all your creature comforts and, and other loves in life. Or maybe you grew up around the things of faith, but the people who introduced Jesus to you didn't seem to look much like Jesus in their own life. Whatever the reason, you begin to find the things in this world far more appealing. <coughs> and it wasn't an immediate switch. Right? But slowly, week after week, month after month, you found yourself drifting just a little bit here and there until following Jesus was like the furthest thing on your mind. And maybe you woke up with this realization that you need to get back to being close to him, but he's so far away because of the slow drift over time. Or maybe... You're still there. And, and this is your wake-up call. This is God speaking to you, saying you're drifting. And you didn't notice it because you haven't been paying attention, but you've drifted farther away than you think. And the encouragement of this letter here is pay more careful attention to your faith in Jesus so you don't lose your bearings. And here's what that looks like. Verse 2, I'm sorry, verse 1, we must listen very carefully to the truth we have heard or we may drift away from it. See, the, the word used here for listen very carefully in the original text, it doesn't really matter that you know this, but just to give you some point of reference, prosekein is the original word here, and, it, and what it's encouraging readers to do is not just hear the words, but then when they hear it, to do something about it, to act on it. That word assumes both is happening. That you hear it and then you do something about it. That you hear, you come on Sunday morning and you hear someone get up in front of you and, and exposit the words of the text of God's word to you. And then you don't just go home and do nothing. But that you're writing down something or you're taking mental notes and you're going like, when I hear this, what is going to be the first action I'm going to do as a result of this? That's what he's saying. Pay, listen very carefully to the truth we have heard, or what? Or we will drift away from it. The people who drift from the words of God are not the ones who are ignoring the words of God. It's the ones who hear it and don't do anything about it. Pay very careful attention. Listen very carefully to the truth we have heard, to what we have heard. What, and what is this? It's the message of salvation through Jesus Christ. It's the good news of Jesus. It's the good news for selfish humans who have quietly or boldly mounted their resistance against the God of the universe. And, and out of that personal rebellion has come loads of painful and hurtful and destructive behaviors. And the Bible calls this sin. 
Each one of us has been infected with this awful disease of sin, and we, we've tried to declare our own independence from God. And, and in so doing, we have pushed God away, we have wounded other people, and we have slowly disintegrated even ourselves. And we've committed sin because we have sin inside of us. All of us do. And this is the bad news in the backdrop of the good news. The good news, because of the depths of the power of his great love and purpose, God did not leave us to the obvious consequences of our rebellion against heaven's king. On the other hand, he just didn't also just throw out all forms of justice and be like, oh, it's, oh, it's okay, it's fine, because it's not. Instead, what he did is he inserted himself into the narrative to personally bear the full weight of the righteous punishment against our sin in our place. That's what Jesus did when he took the eternal consequence for sin on himself, on the cross. He did that so we wouldn't have to. And this is the good news that that though each one of us deserves infinitely worse, we are given the opportunity to receive infinite good when we put our faith in Jesus. When, When we admit that we're the sinner who deserves God's infinite wrath, but it was Jesus who took my punishment on himself and died in my place and rose again the third day, overcoming sin and death and offering new life to anyone who repents and comes back to Jesus in total surrender and allegiance. This is the good news, that that there is new life available, that when you receive the gift of salvation from God, he doesn't just go, okay, cool, I forgive you, now see ya, I'll wait for you in heaven. He goes, no, no, I'm going to enter into your story and stay there, and I'm going to empower you to overcome sin in your life every single day. So I saved you from the punishment of your sin, and then gradually over the course of your life, I won't leave. I'm going to save you from the power of your sin till eventually in glory I'm going to save you from the presence of your sin. And I will not leave you. This is the good news, that even though we have pushed him away, he entered even closer and says, no, 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 let me rescue you from you because there's something greater and it's me. This is the good news because not only are we given a way out of the judgment that we deserve, but we are graciously given a place in God's family. We are made totally and completely right with God. This is the good news. So pay attention. Listen very carefully to what we have heard about the message of salvation through Jesus Christ. And then be very careful to act on it. Don't just let it go in one ear and out the other. Take care that you let it change your life. It's not in my notes. This is just really interesting. This weekend, I was, I was at man camp down at Lake End Camp, and someone asked me, hey, what did you think of the preacher? And it's a really interesting thing when you ask a preacher about another preacher. And I learned... Since coming out of seminary, it's very easy just to talk shop and be critical of other preachers, because it's what I do for a living. And I've had to, because the Lord had to give me a wake-up call, Brent, what I'm far less concerned about is the skill of that other preacher, and what I'm far more concerned about is how preachable, how, how easy you are to be preached to. Will you receive the word of God no matter who's preaching it? Or are you going to have a critical spirit? It's one thing to have a critical mind. It's another thing to have a critical spirit. To say, I'm not going to receive this. This is not a posture of worship. This is not a posture of humility. This is not Jesus in me. This is. Pay very careful attention that you let this change your life. If your life looks the same as it did 10 years ago, and you've been reading this for 10 years, you haven't let it change your life. And the reason he's stressing this so much is because this kind of careful attention actually requires work and effort.
but it's this attention, he says, that it's this labor that keeps believers from drifting away. Now, I'm not saying it's what keeps God close to you, because this is motivated by God already coming close to you. Okay, this, this is out of the power of the Spirit, not in order to get it. But too many people have a casual attitude about their faith today. It's just sort of become this cultural phenomenon that you can really easily identify yourself with Christianity, but if we're not careful, it can be a Christianity in name only, without any true substance of faithfulness despite the circumstances. So the question could be asked, how much attention you're giving to your faith? It could be asked of all of us, do we pay enough attention? Do we pay as close attention to Jesus as we do our stock portfolio or the sports team we're following or even just the progress that we're making at home or at work? Because the truth is, drifting is always easier than maintaining the same position. And just like there are strong poles to drift away and give up on following Jesus in the first century for these Jewish Christians, followers of Jesus today still have subtle influences that can cause us to drift. We have to pay close attention to how we're growing in our faith, how we're prepared to resist temptations we might think we're anchored in our faith, but a hidden, slow-moving current of temptation or an entitled attitude or a seed of bitterness could carry us far away from shore without us even noticing. It's this kind of change is a slow fade. It's, it's an unnoticeable drift. It happens gradually and often goes undetected for years. And so the message of Hebrews for Christians today in this text is pay attention. Pay close attention. In other words, don't hit snooze on the good news. Don't take the gospel for granted. Pay attention and put in the effort to keep growing your faith. Don't be satisfied with where you're at with Jesus. Press in further. Ask for more. And when it gets hard, lean into the grace of God and not away from Him. Now that you've believed him, he's here to help you and strengthen you and hold you together. It was not just the good news one time for you when you just believed. It's the good news for all time, so don't hit snooze on the good news. So what do I do about that this week? I think there's some very practical things we can do, and I'll give you three. Number one is this, make the shift. Shift your attention back in the direction that it needs to be. Shift your focus back to the good news. Be very cautious that you don't drift away. For those who have believed the message of salvation through Jesus Christ, but have taken it for granted, don't treat it as common. Notice when you're slowly drifting away. This is life. Don't let the good news of God's voice Fade into the background noise of your life. Preach the gospel to yourself. Like, imagine for a moment that an angel literally showed up to preach a sermon this morning instead of me. That'd be pretty great, right? Pretty awesome. I mean, that might even make the news. You'd certainly be talking about it for weeks. It'd probably go viral on YouTube, right? You would take that seriously. Here's the point that the passage is making. If you would take that seriously, if, if an angel appeared in front of you, how much more seriously should you take the words of Jesus? How much longer should that affect your life? Because in this life, it's so easy to become careless or complacent in our commitment to Jesus. It, it's not that hard, actually, to backslide into the, slin, into the sin that we had repented from and rejected at one point in our lives. As culture makes it very easy to compromise morality and just ignore the words of Jesus. There are a thousand excuses to neglect service and, and generosity and worship and just become inactive and, and lazy Christians. There is. And a lot of them sound really appealing. The current of temptation pulls so strongly on us. But in order to resist, you're going to have to listen very carefully and, and with the intent to do something about it. Listen very carefully to Jesus. You have to listen to what he's saying to you every day. And not just hearing, but obeying and taking action. We have to make the shift. 
to be listening very carefully to do what he's telling us. Pay attention and make the shift. And when you've made that shift back to your focus on Jesus, number two is reverse the drift. Make the shift and then reverse the drift. In other words, it's, it's one thing to put in the time and the attention necessary to refocus your faith on following Jesus. It's another thing to take it even further into growing your faith. Let me illustrate. It's one thing, if I'm going in the wrong direction, and there's danger that way, and I'm walking, it's one thing to stop and turn around. Be like, no, the good thing is that way, the bad thing is that way, so I'm not going that way anymore. I made the shift. But what he's saying is reverse the drift and start taking actions in a different direction. Nothing's going to change if nothing's going to change. When this happens, you start letting God use you in ways that he made you for, that you don't just refocus again in your life. You go, no, 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 God, I want you to be the one determining what I do about this. I, I, I'm going to put new actions into my life, new systems, new habits into my life. I'm going to put new things on my calendar, new commitments. This week, the, uh, the preaching team here at our three campuses, we are talking about this passage. Um, and Pastor Jason made a really good point about this passage that I haven't got to yet. Now we're here. Check out verses 3 and 4. So what makes us think we can escape if we ignore this great salvation? That was first announced uh, by the Lord Jesus himself and then delivered to us by those who heard him speak. And God confirmed that message. How? By giving signs and wonders and various miracles and gifts of the Holy Spirit whenever he chose. And, and Jason made the comment, he said, this might be the best position statement ever to explain supernatural and spiritual gifts. That God confirmed the message with actions that are only explained by God. And how did he do that? He, he often did that through other people, through gifts of the Holy Spirit. In other words, people who had the Holy Spirit in them and who were giving that gift to other people. Right? Like, whatever your spiritual gift is, God wants to use you to confirm his message in the world around you. He has uniquely wired you and designed you and positioned you in this world to show off the message of Jesus in a way that only you can. No one else can take your job. So the encouragement here is to reverse the drift by actively participating in God's plan to reach and change the world around you. Use your spiritual gift to deliver the good news. For those of us who do have a great reverence for the words of Jesus and the message of the good news, you're not drifting. You're taking the good news seriously. You're not taking it for granted. Your heart is still cherishing the wonder and the power of Jesus in your life. Don't take your role as a messenger lightly. If you've heard him speak to you, you are also one of those messengers sent to bring the good news to those around you who need it. So make the shift and then reverse the drift by actively participating in God's plan to reach the world in the way that he's uniquely wired you and designed you and, and, and formed you for. And then finally, receive the gift. And there's some of you who have heard this message but never responded to it. That you, you, You've heard about the gospel. You've heard about what Jesus has done on the cross. And you're like, man, someday I'll get to it. Maybe, you know, when I'm older. But I got stuff going on in my life right now. I, 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 don't, it's, it's, I don't have the time to just kind of go all in on this Christianity thing. Um, I'm going to hang around it for a while. So eventually I'll give my life to Jesus. And the reality is you're not promised tomorrow. And there is a gift that is extended to you today. And it's called being made right with God. Reality is your sin has separated you from God. You aren't right with God. You haven't been forgiven. Just because you are in the building of a church, that's awesome. But it doesn't make you saved. Just like if I walked into a garage, it doesn't make me a car. And you're here, and God's speaking to you, 
And the invitation is to receive what he's offering. That you can be forgiven. You can be made right with God. And not just delivered from the punishment for your sin, but like delivered into a relationship with God. He wants to know you. He wants to work in your life. He wants to use you for his purposes and his kingdom. If you would take an angel seriously, if it appeared in front of you today, how much more seriously should you take the Son of God, Jesus Christ himself? You can receive the free gift of God's salvation today. Today can begin the rest of your life for eternity. That you can be made right with God today. And the Bible says, if you confess your sin, and you confess that Jesus, and you believe that Jesus died on the cross to pay for that sin, and he rose again three days later, defeating death to give you new life, and you submit to him as Lord, you can be made right with God. Your sins can be forgiven, and you can have an eternal home in heaven. I tell you, that changes purpose. That changes, that changes how I view life. That, that, that gives hope. And you can have that gift today. Would you receive that gift? There's nothing you have to do to earn it. There's nothing you have to do to, to get God's favor. He's offering it freely. You can be made right with God today. So make the shift, reverse the drift, and receive the gift. In other words, don't hit snooze on the good news. This message is so significant. It's so important. It's so huge. If you take an angel seriously, how much more seriously should you take the Son of God himself, Jesus Christ? Don't hit snooze on the good news. Let's pray. Jesus, I pray that you would elevate yourself in our minds and that you'd be speaking to us very clearly. I ask that not only would we feel the pull and the tug from your word to press in closer to you, but, but God, I pray through your Holy Spirit that you would reveal the specific action steps that each one of us needs to take. That we don't walk out these doors without a plan. We don't walk out these doors without a, um, a commitment to doing something to draw closer to you, God. So I, pr- I pray, Lord, that you would begin pointing that out in our lives. That not only would we know the pull and the, the importance and the, the, the urgency of paying attention to you and doing what you say, but that you'd also walk with us as we figure out how to do that as well. We pray all this in Jesus' name.